Hi, everybody, and welcome to Willow Creek. I'm so glad that you're joining us. If you're like me, when I'm worshiping along at home, I'm usually sitting down, but for this first song, I really need to get you involved. We're gonna move around a little bit. If you're a kid especially, I want you to stand up, get some room around you, and I need you to dance along to this song. So wherever you are, turn your volume up, and let's worship together. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending 
lost your fault Still your love fought for me You have been You have been so, so good to me When I felt no worth When I felt no worth You paid it all for me You have been so, so kind
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that truth that we are your children. And I pray for myself and for my brothers and sisters this morning that our identity would rest in that truth above our productivity, above our jobs, above how other people think of us, that we would understand and know that our person rests in the truth that we are your children. And we thank you for that. God, we believe that your love is perfect and you say your perfect love casts out fear. So I pray that this morning and even throughout this week, we would be able to rest in your love. We thank you for this. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. And everyone said, amen. Wherever you're watching from today, we just want to say welcome and that we're so glad that you are with us. If you happen to be watching live immediately after this service, we are going to have a post-service Zoom gathering where you can meet with staff and find out about ways to get connected, how to get involved, and also get questions answered. So you can either text in the number at the bottom of the screen or plan to join us right after the service for this Zoom gathering. Two weeks ago, our church started something called the Build a Box Initiative, where our hope is to fill 10,000 boxes with food for our neighbors. And I'm happy to tell you that we are halfway there. 
Just last week, I was at the care center, and a guy pulled up in his car, and he said that he wanted 80 boxes. And we said, what in the world, 80 boxes? And he told us that he was planning to involve his entire men's soccer team, and they are filling the boxes together. Really cool. I've also heard of section communities that are inviting neighbors to join them to fill boxes, or also families that are shopping together, even online, to be able to fill these boxes. So we're getting them back with notes of encouragement, and they're decorated, and we just want to say thank you to all of you who have participated so far. The deadline for this is going to be Sunday, May 31st. So the Care Center will be open and available to pick up a box or to drop one off between the hours of 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. So please come by and help us meet this goal. The only way that we can do projects like this or connect as community is because of giving. And there are two ways that you can give. One of them is through willowcreek.tv. There's a give button that all you have to do is click there and then it'll send you straight to a giving platform. Or also you can text the the letters WCSB to the number 77977. So thanks for giving, and we really hope that you can check out either of those ways to give. So we have Eugene Cho with us this weekend to give the message, and message notes can be found at willowcreek.org backslash next steps. And before Eugene begins, we have a special word from Matt Wright. Throughout the season of our church, uh, there have been many people who have helped to guide us and pastor us and teach us. And one of those people is Eugene Cho. Uh, For the last year and a half, Eugene has been so generous to Willow in a very unique way as one of our most consistent teachers. Eugene personally felt God's call to partner with us and to help us navigate through a pretty uh, unique and challenging period. Uh, He sacrificed and he surrendered personally in order to serve us. And so now at Willow Creek, as our church looks forward to stepping into a new season, Eugene is also stepping into a new season as well. He's gonna tell you all about that in just a few moments. But before he does, I would love for us to just thank Eugene for all that he uh, has done. So Eugene, thank you. Thank you for the way that you have pastored us for the last year and a half. There is no mess that God is not able to enter and work within your life. While we can acknowledge pain and evil and brokenness in the world, He, God, the one and only God is greater than that which is in this world. Friends, this man is not just a man. He's not just a good teacher. This is Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. He is the way, the truth, and the life, the name above every name. Every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess. Who is this man? He is worthy to be worshiped. He is worthy. Say that with me. He is worthy. Thank you, Eugene. I'm very grateful for the many challenging and uplifting conversations that you've had uh, with me. Uh, You invested in me, you invested in all of us. And I think that we have all grown closer to the people that God wants us to be because of your investment, so thank you. We love you. Uh, Please know that you will always have friends here at Willow Creek. And now we wanna pray for you and commission you toward the things that God has called you to do. Can we all pray together? God, thank you for Eugene. You knew exactly what we needed here at Willow Creek. Thank you for bringing Eugene in the way that he has consistently taught us and challenged us, that he has spurred us on toward love and good and good deeds. God, thank you for that. And now as Eugene and his family take the next step in ministry, we ask that you would bless them, keep them. God, would you bless his steps? Lord, would you keep his family? Lord, we love him. We pray this together in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Willow, it is so good to be with you again, even during this challenging and yet even hopeful season. I have been thinking of and lifting the Willow Creek Church family in prayer. Now, in case we haven't met, my name is Pastor Eugene Cho. And for the past year and a half, 
I've had both the privilege and the burden of being a regular constant teacher during this time of transition. Now, I say the words both privilege and burden because after a while, you form friendship. And after friendship, there's a sense of family and Willow has grown to become a family to me and my wife. So thank you for allowing me the privilege of teaching during this time. Now, it's also bittersweet because this is the last time that I'll be preaching under this current arrangement, but hopefully in the future, I'll get a chance to visit again as we worship together. Now, on that note, I just want to extend my congratulations, blessings, and prayers to Pastor Dave Dummett and his family as he transitions into the role as the new senior pastor at Willow Creek. May the Lord grant you favor, wisdom, courage, and deep compassion as you serve this church, Chicago, and beyond. Now, I want to be a little selfish here and ask for some personal prayer as well. My wife and I, we will be soon transitioning as I lead as the new president and CEO starting on July 1 of a Christian advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C. called Bread for the World. Bread for the World engages the political process compelled by our faith in Jesus because we believe that those who struggle with hunger and poverty, that they especially matter to Jesus and the kingdom of God. And our calling is to advocate and to speak up, to fight for those who struggle with hunger in our churches, our neighborhoods, our cities, our nation, and all around the world. So when you have a moment, please lift a prayer for me. Check out bread.org. And perhaps if you feel con compelled and convicted, join the movement of bread.org. Now, friends, if you have your Bibles with you, I want to ask you to turn right now to the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. The Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. Now, as you might know, whenever I read Scripture at Willow, I encourage all those who are able to rise to their feet in, as a sign of reverence for God's Word. And even during this time, as we're all worshiping in our respective homes, I want to invite you, for those who are able, let's rise to our feet as we read the Word of God together. John chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas also known as Didymus, Nathanael from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. 
none of the disciples dared ask him where or who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, go ahead and have a seat. Well, Willow, I suspect that for each and every single one of us, there are certain stories that really speak to us. Maybe they're considered our favorite stories or the go-to stories in the Bible that we often read during encouraging or maybe even discouraging seasons. John 21, this entire chapter, but especially the 14 verses, this happens to be one of my all-time favorite stories in the Bible. Not just to teach from, I'm speaking about stories that I love to read that ministers to me and my soul and what I'm going through in my life. Now, there's two main reasons why I love this story. The first one is more personal, and the second is really about honesty and vulnerability. Let me talk about the first one. What's really life-giving in my life, one of my hobbies, pastimes, is I love the outdoors and I specifically love fishing. And this happens to be a fishing story. The second reason why I love this is because when you read under the layers, when you peel the onion of the story, you realize it's not just a fishing story that as you peel off the layers, you begin to realize there's a sense of raw vulnerability and honesty, and that's what really speaks to me. Now, when Peter says, I'm going fishing, he's not just saying, I have nothing else to do, and therefore, I'm going to go fishing. And of course, as you read, Peter being the vocal leader that he is, the other disciples followed suit. It's not just a fishing story. Pastors and scholars who have studied and exegeted this passage, they believe that when Peter says, I'm going fishing, what he's really trying to say is, I'm done and I want to go back to what I was doing before I met Jesus and became a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, I know that as Christians, especially as a pastor, I'm supposed to say that following Jesus is the greatest, the best thing, the most amazing thing in the whole wide world. It's true, it really is. But if we also don't speak about the cost of following Jesus, to be a follower of Jesus is not an easy thing. This is why scripture tells us to count the cost and follow Jesus. So when Peter says, I'm going fishing, he's saying, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm worn out, I have no idea what I'm doing, this isn't what I signed up for. How many times in our lives have we uttered through our lips or maybe in our own minds, I'm done, I'm exhausted, I want to go back to what I was doing. This is why I love this story because there's such a raw human honesty and vulnerability. Now, I am praying because if you're alive, breathing right now, we all know every single one of us, we've experienced a moment in our lives and we're going to experience future moments where we feel so discouraged we might be tempted to quit. It's for that reason today from our passage, I wanna to speak to you about five very quick points that I hope will encourage and minister to you. Here's point number one. It's the most important point. No matter what happens, if you feel lost, if you feel so exhausted and drained, you've got to keep coming back to point number one. Here's point number one. Pause for dramatic effect. 
Point number one, here it is, three words. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. I know that we're a few weeks past Resurrection Sunday. And even this story happens to be a couple weeks after crucified Jesus, risen Jesus, appears to the disciples. They're all invigorated and excited. You would think they would be on a spiritual high because their rabbi, their Lord, their master who was crucified is now indeed risen. He is who he says he is and yet they find themselves discouraged to the point that they want to quit. Why? Because they're human. None of us are perfect. None of us have it all together. None of us have a faith that can weather all things. There are going to be moments in our lives where we feel so depleted, and it's especially during those moments that we have to utter and sing and pray and be reminded that Jesus is alive. The tomb is still empty. In other words, this Jesus Christ is not just a good moral teacher. He's not just a fictitious character. He's not some revolutionary figure. Jesus Christ is Lord, Savior, and Master. He is who He says He is. He is the Alpha, the the Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus is God, and Jesus is still in control. That's point number one. Don't forget Point number one. The second point that I want to make is the word clarity. Now, you have to ask the question, why would the disciples be discouraged? You would think that they've seen this crucified, risen Jesus and therefore would be extremely encouraged. Jesus gives them a word, commandments, encourages. He gives them a mission to make disciples of all nations, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And I'm just imagining them, think about the last dance, the Chicago Bulls having that moment before they get onto the court. They're so excited, but what ends up happening is that when Jesus disappears after giving them a vision, I suspect Peter or the other disciples basically saying, okay, so how do we do this? Have you ever received a vision from God? Have you ever had a conviction from the Holy Spirit? You know that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, nudged you, prompted you in some way. But after that subsides, you're asking yourself, wait, how do I do this? You see, clarity is another word for control. We all want control over our lives. In addition to the fact that there are real health concerns because of COVID-19, I think the reason why so many of us are struggling during this health pandemic is that we realize we don't have control over our lives, our schedules, where we can go shopping, where we can work, where we can drive, where we can get our hair cut, and the list goes on and on, and it just so upsets us. See, the disciples, I want you to realize, they decide to go fishing because Peter used to be a fisherman. And I want you to know that they actually had a very successful small business. Owned a boat, owned nets. They made a living out of these things. They fished that water, the Sea of Galilee, thousands of times, which means that they knew the best times to go fishing, the best methods, the best spots. They knew how to catch fish. As I shared earlier, I love fishing. And so as a result, I have numerous equipment to help me in my fishing hobby. I have a five, six rod, a six foot rod, a six, six rod, an eight foot rod, a 10 foot rod for salmon and steelhead. I have a mixture of light, 
medium and heavy rods. I have different kinds of lines that I use, including monofilament and braided line. I have different kinds of reels. I have a bait caster. I also have a regular spin caster rod. I have lots of lures that I use. I can use plastic worms for Carolina rigs, Texas rigs, and the list goes on. I have lures that are top water lures, lures that sink in at two feet four feet, six feet. I have crankbait lures that go all the way to the bottom at 10 to 14 feet underwater because they all help me depending on fishing. You see, I want you to know that I really know what I'm doing when I say I enjoy fishing. In fact, I brought a picture of a big fish that I recently caught. Here it is. Some of you might be wondering, What's the purpose of me showing this fish in the sermon? There is no purpose. I'm just showing off because that's what fishermen do. I've even had the privilege of fishing with one of your Willow Creek staff, Paul Johnson. Here's a weird picture of him fishing for chairs. Now, anyways, back to the sermon The point about this is that the disciples think they're in control and they want clarity over their lives. And what Jesus promises us is never clarity. The gospel is not, I will give you absolute control over your life. The gospel is Jesus gives, yes, the gift of salvation, but in addition to the gift of salvation, the forgiveness of sins, he gives us the gift of himself. Jesus himself is the gift. When you read through scripture, Matthew 28, 20, he promises that he will be with us always. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39, nothing will separate us from the love of Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's point number three, God's voice. We need to learn to listen to God's voice in a society and a culture that is so busy, crazy, hectic, noisy. We need to learn how to carve out space, place, time to listen to the voice of God and be sensitive and aware to the presence of the Holy Spirit. In this story, While we can learn from some of the mistakes of the disciples, we can also see them learning and growing. In this story, they begin to hear a voice about a hundred yards away from shore. And as Jesus asks the question, friends, haven't you any fish? Now we all know Jesus who knows everything already knows that they have zero fish. But to the credit of the disciples, they listen. And when Jesus gives them the instruction, cast the net on the right side of the boat, they listen and in their obedience, they catch 153 fish, which was the exact precise number of the known species of fish during that time of the Bible story. In other words, As Christians, what this story reminds us is that we might think we're experts. We might think we're know-it-alls. We've got our methodologies. We have our networks. We have our connections. We have our resources. We can have all of these things. But apart from Jesus, apart from our connection to our master, we can do nothing. We might think in the short run, we can achieve and achieve and achieve, and that might be true, but in the marathon of life and faith and discipleship, hear these words, sisters and brothers. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Here's the fourth point that I wanna make, it's this, the word emotions. 
Now, I want to be very careful about how I speak about emotions. You see, Peter was known to be someone who wore his emotions on his sleeves. He's the one that boasts, I will never deny you. I will never forsake you. And we know how that story goes. He's the one that draws his sword to chop off a soldier's ear. He's very vocal, very emotional. Now, I'm not knocking it because that's part of what it means to be human and part of the uniqueness of our personalities. So I want you to hear this very carefully. Our emotions and our feelings are important. They make who we are as human beings, but it's also equally important to share that while we acknowledge that feelings and emotions are important and we should leave room and space for it, we are not ruled by our emotions and feelings. In other words, we don't worship our feelings and emotions. We worship Jesus. If you and I are only guided by our feelings and our emotions, there are times it feels we're like that rod or that reed that's constantly being battered by the situation and the culture around us. There's room, space for our feelings and emotions but ultimately may we be reminded that my faith is in the rock, the fortress, Jesus Christ, the one true God. Here's the fifth thing that I'll share. It's grace. We can't say enough about grace. We can't sing enough. We can't preach enough about grace. And I love this story where Peter and the other disciples, as they're coming towards Jesus, I can imagine Jesus choosing to say lots of different other words besides come and have breakfast. If I was in Jesus' shoes, can you imagine Jesus as Peter approaches Jesus? Can you imagine Jesus saying, "Mm, mm, mm, mm," just nodding? or shaking his head in disapproval? Can you imagine Jesus giving one word responses? Dude, really? Seriously? Again? Or what if it gets even more serious? Peter, you're a failure. I can't use you. You have no hope. You have no future. My favor and calling upon your life being the cornerstone by which the church will be built. No, no longer. My favor no longer rests upon you. But rather than those words, I can just picture Jesus simply looking at Peter right in the eyes. Not with disdain, not with judgment, but of invitation And he simply directs Peter to have a seat and then says some of the most beautiful words of grace. Come and have breakfast. And Jesus feeds Peter. Jesus feeds the other disciples. And Jesus takes time to remind us that, yes, this is a story about grace, but I want you to know this is not just a feel-good breakfast story. It's not just a fuzzy, make-you-feel-good story. As Jesus feeds them, He also restores them and then recommissions them for the work that Jesus has in store for them. Friends, hear these words. Jesus loves you. Jesus today wants to feed you and nurture you and bless you. But that's not all that Jesus has for you. He wants to do all of those things and it's so important, but he also wants to remind you and recommission you. God is not yet done with you. I'm speaking to you right now every person who's listening to this voice, God is not yet done with you. God is not yet done 
with your friendship, with your marriage, with your family, and God is not yet done with Willow. During this season, at times, there is a temptation to become very insular and just focus on ourselves or to hide in shame or embarrassment. And yes, there is an important work of confession and repentance. And I pray that that happens, continues to happen, but I also pray and believe that God is reminding every single one of you, feed my sheep, teach the gospel, live the gospel, spread the gospel in Chicago, in this country, and throughout the world. For the glory of Jesus, God bless you. Let's pray. So Father, thank you again for this opportunity to study your word, to worship together as a church family. I pray that you would encourage, especially those who feel tempted to quit that which you've called them to do. Encourage them, exhort them, fill them with your Holy Spirit. And I also pray, God, for Willow Creek. Thank you for the promise that it has never been about us, has always been about you. Remind us and convict us again. You are not yet done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. As one season ends, another one begins. Last weekend, Elevate and Impact celebrated our eighth graders and our seniors in high school as they graduated. And we just wanna say way to go. We did some drive-by drop-off gifts and we're grateful for these families and students that are a part of our church. Congratulations. In the next two weeks, we will also be welcoming our sixth graders and ninth graders into Elevate and Impact. And just wanna remind you that summer is a great time for students to get connected and we really hope that you jump in and join us. You can go to willowcreek.org backslash next steps for more information about that. This past week, over 3,000 people joined our church together on Facebook Live to pray. And this week, we're gonna continue praying as a church. We are going to do neighborhood prayer walks together and you can go online and find a guide that will guide us through the Lord's Prayer at willowcreek.org backslash next steps. Next weekend, Megan Marshman will lead us in communion and with a special message. We really hope to see you there. And if you're new, don't forget that you can go to our Zoom gathering immediately after the service. Have a great week, everybody.